Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about some work that we've been doing, have just started doing this year, and hope to continue looking at the professional standards documents that we produce. I'll just do a very quick introduction to CIFAR. I hope most of you are familiar with the organisation, and if you're not, please do come and see us on the, on the stall in the exhibition hall. We'd be delighted to talk to you. Um, our role is as a professional body, so we set um, standards of practice and promote professional ethics. Um, we do that in two ways. One is by monitoring standards of people, um, so our members have to meet quality and um, competence standards in order to become members of the Institute, and also to set standards for processes and products, so the work that archaeologists do and good practice guidance. As a chartered institute, which is a peculiarly UK um, designation, although with in relevance in, in some other countries around the world, our role is to promote the public interest. So ensuring that our members work in the public interest. We're not a, a society to promote necessarily the interests of our members, although we would think of those two things as being very closely aligned. And we have a very strong message about the value that archaeology adds to society and to business. And we've very specifically linked that into our professional standards documents so that we can say that if archaeology isn't adding value, it's not being done to professional standards. And that's a, that's a really important part um, of the work that we've been doing recently. So just to give you an outline, um, sim in, similar to the, to the RPA, we have a code of conduct, which is the high-level document that sets out the ethical obligations that our members have to fulfil. And that's supported by a range of, of policy statements. Underneath that, we have these, our standards and guidance documents. Um, and they set out um, standards of practice covering all sorts of different um, archaeological endeavour. They're also supported, there is a, another <laughs> tier underneath this, which is, which is technical guidance, good practice guidance. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into very much detail on that. Um, so the standards and guidance themselves uh, are intended to define good practice and to expand on our code of conduct and explain how that actually translates into the work that archaeologists do. Um, they're very formulaic documents in some ways, so they start out with a standard which is a very short statement that describes an outcome. They're not about prescribing methodology, they don't tell you necessarily how to achieve the outcome, but they do give advice and guidance on how the sector currently um, recognises good practice um, and um, the methods by which we currently advocate those, those outcomes can be achieved. And they're formulated by the sector, and that's, that's a really important point. They're not handed down by some higher authority. They're written by groups of archaeologists coming together, specialists in their field, and deciding what good practice should be at this moment in time. So they're obviously evolving documents as well. They should move forward. They're not, they're not set in stone, and they're not, uh, they're not um, handed down from on high. And they're used... Um, widely in the UK, particularly for as a, as a quality standard, so um, used to design archaeological work and used as the benchmark when work is commissioned. Um, and most uh, most of our local authorities, when they're they're setting a, a brief for a piece of work to be done within the spatial planning system, for example, will say that it must comply with CIFA standards and guidance. There are lots of them. Um, most of them, uh, many of them date back to the early days of the Institute. Obviously, they've changed a little bit in time over, over that period. Um, and they cover all the things that you would expect. So archaeological excavation, field evaluation, uh, desk-based assessments. Um, we have some very specific ones for geophysical survey, for forensic archaeology. Um, a slightly little odd one here about nautical archaeological recording, which is, which is a very specific and, and niche area. And the most recent um, one that we produced probably about five years ago now um, covers that consultancy role for commissioning um, archaeological work and procur procuring services. So it's more about how the ethical provisions in our code of conduct translate in that day-to-day -day transactional relationship between clients and consultants and people actually doing the, the, the um, field work, if, if, that's, if that's a different organisation. <coughs> this is an example, as I say, uh, the standard itself is a very brief statement. Um, 
And in some ways, it's, it's a very bland statement because these documents aren't intended to be prescriptive. Um, they're intended to, to set out an, an outcome. Um, they don't tell you how to do an excavation. They're not there if you were day one, didn't know what you were doing, you don't pick up the standard guidance and it tells you what to do. It tells you what you're trying to achieve and the standard that you're trying to achieve. And one of the things that we've been looking at recently is how, how relevant these documents still are, um, how they're being used by practitioners and how they need to evolve in the future if they're going to continue to be relevant. And one particular area that's, that's causing us um, a little bit of difficulty at the moment, most of them have a statement along these lines in them. They're very much founded in UK professional practice. And that's for a very good reason, because as I said in an earlier slide, it's because they're formulated by the sector. And when they were formulated, most of our members were in the UK. Now, most of them still are, but we have an expanding membership in a, a range of other countries. And even within the UK, professional practice is changing. So the, the regulatory frameworks across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland have changed. And we might need to have different guidance in the future for each of those, those jurisdictions. So this is an area that we're particularly looking at um, and potentially thinking about in the future whether we need to have one standard that sits above everything and then potentially different guidance that applies in different countries. Um, and that's one of the problems that brings us to uh, one of the biggest challenges really, which is, is when you get into that discussion about which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Because in order to gain traction, in order to be relevant to members in other countries, we need our documents not to look like UK documents. Because that doesn't make sense if you're an archaeologist working in Germany or in um, Azerbaijan or in Outer Mongolia or wherever you might happen to be. But unless we have members in those areas, we can't formulate the guidance. Um, we can't, we don't have a sector operating in those, in those areas um, to help develop that guidance. So that's one of the, the, the real challenges um, that we're trying to explore at the moment. And we're discussing with colleagues, particularly in Germany with the Sifa Deutschland group, as how, how do we get that momentum and enough members in Germany to start formulating the guidance that's, that's relevant and obviously not having to start from scratch because we have the basic documents there, but how do we need to amend um, and adapt them in the future? Um, and that's going to potentially, uh, from a resource point of view, that's quite a, that's quite a big challenge um, to, to take forward. Um, so as I say, these are, these are the areas that we're looking at, as well as expanding into areas um, looking at, at met, providing documents and guidance and advice for members outside the UK. We're also obviously looking at constantly changing methodological practices, trying to keep it um, on, up to date with technological changes and the way that practice advances. And also recently debating a lot, our standards and guidance tend to be used as a minimum standard. So it tends to come down to minimum compliance. Um, and that's not really what we want to be doing. Yes, we do need to have that minimum standard that says above this is professionally acceptable, below it is professionally unacceptable. But we also want to promote best practice and we also want to look at innovation and how, how we can evolve the standards and guidance so that people don't just say, well, right, what's the minimum I need to do? Where's my checklist? Right, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. I've achieved a professional standard. We want our organisations, our registered organisations, our members to be thinking creatively um, and innovatively about how they approach different pieces of work. So that, that is, a, is a big challenge. The other big challenge that we're facing is how we make sure, um, how we ensure compliance and encourage the balance between carrot and stick. Do we threaten to throw people out of the institute because they've not met the standards? Or do we work with them and provide more training and guidance to uh, Kenny's waving the stick? Um, to, to encourage them and to help them meet the standards. And we talk a lot about trying to um, ensure a level playing field. Um, and it's a slightly mythical level playing field, I think, in reality. But, but what our standards should do is give those competing organisations who are bidding for work the baseline um, in that process. We also find there's a very poor understanding of what self-regulation means 
um, in the UK, we don't have, say there is no higher authority that tells us how to do things. There's no definition, no formal definition of an archaeologist outside of CIFA's definition. And that's, that causes a problem. So organisations, individuals can operate outside of, of the CIFA structures and still compete within that environment. And of course, the more we promote the rules, the more we promote the standards, the more likely we are to start getting complaints and allegations of professional misconduct, which has um, uh, it's, its own set of resource issues of how we deal with those and how we make sure that members see that when things do go wrong, we are effective in, in, in taking action um, against them. I'm going to leave those challenges with you because I think I've probably run out of time, um, but I'll look forward to discussing them um, hopefully later on in the session. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.